Bialy, Yellow Bitty, Marlu. The rocks there are some of the oldest ever discovered on the surface of the earth. Willera, Bundera. And then just north of here in the World Ranges, we have rocks that are over 4 billion years old. So this area of the world, in fact, is some of the oldest rocks ever discovered. And you, you really get a sense of that, I think, when you're in the landscape out here. Of my ancestors, Aboriginal people, been, been on this land for 40 odd thousand years. We're using the newest things, these telescopes, to look back at some incredibly old parts of the universe, some of which will be about the same age as the rocks are over there. When you're standing in nature, surrounded by the rocks that are weathered by the wind, and watching the leaves move on plants that were formed by several million years of evolution. Hearing the wing beats of a babbler, and then a chiming wedgebill whose forms are entirely influenced by their ancient association with the environment. You can almost feel the interwoven tapestry of time wrapping itself around you like a layer of sweat in the wet season. And perhaps time is felt nowhere more than this place, the Murchison in Western Australia. This is Off Track, and I'm Anne Jones, sticking to the arid ribs of the continent along the western side of Australia, where the land spreads low and wide into pastoral leases and mining and crown land, and there's a cutting-edge array of radio telescopes. Cloud clear below 1, 2,000 feet. Visibility 10 kilometres. Dew point 1, 9. So how do you get to the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder site? Geraldton, AWS Aerodrome... First, you get yourself to Geraldton, about a third of the way up the coast of WA. It's a port town and it has a big airport as well. And because it's the start of the week, I hitch a ride with the CSIRO workers in a charter plane to Bellardi Station. Senator Charlie Juliet, Quebec taxis. Oh, you're the Quebec Senate. Charlie, Julia, Quebec, and I find Chieftain taxiing Geraldton runway 214 Bulati with 6 PV. Oh, you're the Quebec Squawk 4217, no reported ISR traffic. 4217 and no traffic, Charlie, Julia, Quebec. The agricultural landscape fades away and red earth pokes between low lying vegetation. And after landing along a clear strip of runway, it's still another 40 or so minutes drive. And surprisingly, the place is awash with green. Yeah, these last three weeks, we've had a lot of rain out here. Um, and a couple of times we haven't been able to get in, a couple of times we haven't been able to get people out, so. That's Anthony Schinkel, the project director for the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder. There's nothing like doing several hundred K of that to really drive home how remote it is. Exactly. So the first 10 trips I did out here in 2007, or five return trips, I didn't see a single car on this road. Um, it's 200 K dirt back from here, back to Pindar, to the, the main paved road. Not a single car. This road used to be rated about 1.5 cars per day was the acknowledged traffic rate. Needless to say, this huge piece of the nation's scientific equipment is a fair way out of town. The landscape isn't monotonous, but it's enthralling. It casts a spell on you of calm timelessness as you stare out the car window. And when you least expect it, the first antenna appears. And then within minutes, more and more appear. Tall, white dishes stand like massive fungi on little stalks in the landscape. 
Optical astronomy is limited by white light that's generated by people near big cities. So more and more you'll see normal telescopes into the mountains, further and further away from people. Radio astronomy is exactly the same, that everything mankind does these days, our phones, our refrigerators, our cars, it all has electronics in it, generates radio frequency noise, and it's often doing that in the same frequency bands that we want to be looking at the universe in. And so we have to get away from people. We have to get away as far as we can from anything that's man-made. So you're saying to me that my fridge is giving off the same waves that a universe a bazillion miles away is giving off? Some of them, definitely. Not all of them, but some of them are definitely in those same frequency ranges. So we have to be able to observe where there's nothing electrical, basically. The numbers are so silly. You know, all of the numbers we deal with are, are so extreme. So on the one hand, everything in the universe is, is so big, and yet it's also so far away that it looks tiny. We know the energy that's been expended in stars and the movements of objects is incredible. It's, it's you know, our sun is a star like many other stars in the universe, and there's billions of them in every galaxy. So we know the energy that's, that's being consumed, that's being emitted is enormous. And yet because of the distances, the energy we receive from these objects in any of the bands, in optical or in, in radio, is tiny. So for example, if we put something like a garage door open on the moon, the, for a radio telescope, that would be the brightest source there is, just a garage door opener. So it gives you some idea how these other incredibly powerful objects are so far away that by the time their signals get here, they're effectively very diluted. This array of radio antenna is so sensitive that it will give us an unprecedented view of the energy that's out there. This telescope in particular, ASCAP, its, its real niche is the maximum sky coverage. So it's a survey telescope, by which we mean that we can see an enormous amount of the sky, but also see it to great sensitivity. So the actual unique part about ASCAP, the thing that really has never been done before, is that we have an area receiver in the focal plane. So what does that mean? Normal radio telescopes literally just have one pixel. So a normal radio telescope looks up at the sky and it just sees one small area of the sky. So to make a map or an image, you effectively have to move the telescope around, scan it backwards and forwards and slowly build up the image. So what we've done here is develop a radio camera. It's called a phased array feed, and uh, we're installing it on each of the 36 antennas here at ASCAP. These new cameras, with well over 100 more pixels than any previous ones used in this field, are on each of the dishes, and they can take much wider images of the sky. But where it gets really amazing is that these 36 antenna can all work together. They cross-reference their pixels and get a really accurate picture. This technique, combining lots of antenna signals into one big photo, is called interferometry. It's mind-boggling. So, for example, we, we think we know about, we've discovered around about 700 million radio galaxies that we've actually got images of and we know they exist. But we think that there's probably about another 70 million more that we will discover with ASCAP. So it's not just an increase in a factor of a couple, we're going to increase our knowledge of radio galaxies by maybe a factor of 100. And that's just an, we don't know what that will mean. We really have no idea what that will mean. So the next five years with ASCAP is going to be incredibly exciting. Looking out from here, what I can see is probably about 18 of the ASCAP dishes. The nearest one is probably 200 metres away. At the moment, it's the middle of the day, so it's a maintenance period. You can see they're all basically looking straight up. We've got some staff over there. You can see in the cherry picker doing some maintenance. But I also see the juxtaposition. It's red earth. It's incredibly green at the moment because we've just had three weeks of incredibly heavy rains. Behind me, I have a building where we have the equivalent of the entire internet's worth of data going into the computer in there every second. So it's just this bizarre juxtaposition between the classic worn Australian outback and something that's literally at the very cutting edge of the data processing world. 
This whole place is a study of contrasts. It's futuristic technology, all here to look to the universe's past. It's remote-controlled antennas standing like white sentinels against a landscape that is almost unfathomably old. It's one of the newest bits of the nation's scientific kit. And it's Wadjuri country. Uh, my name's Leonie Boddington, um, Wadjuri from Wadjuri country. My Yamaji name is Jibulu, and I work for CSIRO as an Aboriginal liaison officer. So, what does this place mean to you? It means a lot. I was told my family come from here, so it's it's like you know identifies me as as Wadjuri coming from this part of the country also the neighbouring country, um, Woolene, so on my father's side, so um, it's important to me. To, so I know who I am, where I come from. I'm going to mention Uncle Ernie Dingo, who did the um, DNA Nation documentary, and he's on my mother's side, and his mother's side, um, they traced his DNA to back to the Murchison, and they haven't moved from the Murchison for 40-odd thousand years. 40,000 years um, living in the same area. That's amazing, isn't it? That's wonderful. It is. That yeah. just confirmed, you know, we knew, you know, our people have been here a long time, but that was just like, yep, yeah, proof. So what's it like to see these big dishes and things on your country? Um, I think it's very exciting, for, from me anyway. Um, I didn't even know who CSIRO was and until they decided, you know, to have a community meeting and do something on, on, on our, my, our country and Wadjuri country. And I thought, who are these people? What do they want? So I went, across, went along to their community meetings they had, Googled them and looked them up and found out, you know, one of the world-leading scientific organisations in the world are on our, on our country. And always had interest in, in the stars and and the universe and stuff, so I found it really exciting. So I've been involved from the start. I, I love coming out here. I get very excited coming out here. I just feel like just just getting out of the car, walking, sitting under the tree. Just It just feels so nice, you know, even though to other people it may not seem like anything. Um, nothing out here. It's all dry, dead and everything, but to us and... Most Aboriginal people, um, the, the place sort of comes alive. You know, it, it, everything has a name. The trees have a name, a Wadjuri name, the rocks, the hills. So everything sort of comes to life for us as, as you come and drive back onto country. And you know what else has a name? Each individual antenna in the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder. Leonie Boddington. Um, Yalabiti, Maralu. Bundura, and Star, Willara, and um, so and the Jingu, which is my dad's name. <gasps> is it? So yeah, no, one of the twenty-seven is number twenty-seven is named after him. Oh, that's wonderful. Was he, did he come out and take part in the ceremony? Yeah, he's been involved in the with the um, the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory opening. So he was the songman for the dancers and also he was also the songman at the naming ceremony for the first, I think the first six antennas and after that all the others were named as well. He's our last known Wadri songman that, wow. that I know of, I don't know any others and no one else has come forward so he, he, he's a different person when you ask him about language, culture and stuff. Yeah. One of them's named after your dad, and then there's. Are they, are they named, one of them you said named after the word for stars? Did you say yeah. which was the word for stars? Bundara. Bundara. That's. And Willara is a moon. A moon. Willara. Yeah. Oh. So they're all on the inside of the door of the tower of the antennas. So with a syllable breakdown and the meaning. So. Oh, it'd be that'd be nice in the future. You know, when no matter who's working here, they could be international people. Um, they can still refer to them by their names. Yeah. 
the they're proper, they're real names. Yeah, <laughs> even though they all look the same, they, you know, they all got different wadgering. <laughs> it would be nice though, different colours or something maybe. But <laughs> well, we used to, when we were kids, we lived on the station and we used to, we used to always be camped outside on cyclone beds, you know, looking up at the stars. So. And, you know, we'd always see moving satellites, what, what the old, old people said they were satellites, so I had no idea. They talked about um, the emu in the sky. Um, my mum always said, look for the Southern Cross in, in the sky, so that's the start of the head of the emu. So if the head's sort of up in a sitting position as you see the shape in the sky, um, that means it's not laying eggs, but if when it's laying, you can see the head shape and it's laying down. That's all the women know. We know when to look for emu eggs. But it's all about men's business, so that's really a men's area. So that's that's all I know about the emu in the sky is when we know to look for emu eggs. So you use it as an indicator of, that it's time to get out there and see if you can find some, some yummy food. Emu eggs, yeah. yeah. Fresh ones. Nice. What do you use the emu eggs for? Um, scrambling, omelettes. Um, a lot of sponge cakes are made early in the year when they've got the fresh eggs, so... Usually steal, we try to steal one or two at a time so the emu she can lay more eggs. Because if you are thinking if you take all of them, they're not going to lay any more there. You know how when they make those um, documentaries about Central Australia and they say this great big untouched landscape, it's really probably an inaccurate way of describing this landscape because I imagine that pre-European settlement and takeover, there was actually a lot of land management that was happening. Yes. How would people have looked after the land? There's, there's, there's water holes all over the country, so, you know, different people and families and groups um, usually take care of um, water holes and stuff on country. They need to take care of stuff on country, like significant sites and, and that. I don't think we're against anything that's infrastructure or whatever they're going to build. We just need their respect of, you know, our, our ancestors being here before, our significant sites out on country. We just need other people to respect that. Our ancestors been here 40 odd thousand years, building a, you know, survival system while they're building empires and state building, you know, our ancestors, Aboriginal ancestors are building a survival system for 40 odd thousand years. That puts it in a bit of context, doesn't it? But that's the weird thing about this place. It's like a series of interacting ancient stories of galaxies far distant sending a tiny wave of energy towards the Earth, of human arrival and perseverance in a landscape that's both starkly dangerous to the uneducated and bluntly gorgeous. And the most cutting edge of technology available to modern Australia. Data, wet dreams, it's all housed in a very dull looking shed like building. Anthony Schinkel. Okay, the thing that's unusual about this building and the reason that we're out here is much like optical astronomy these days, you can't do radio astronomy close to people. Everything we own, our cars, our refrigerators, our cell phones, generates RFI. So we have to come out here to get away from all the man-made radio noise. And the problem is once we're out here, we are our own worst enemies because all of our electronics, everything from our computers to all the supercomputer stuff, generates huge amounts of radio frequency noise. And we don't want our own telescopes picking that up. So we have to shield the building to make sure all that noise is kept inside the building and doesn't leak out and get into the telescope. The whole skin of the building is a continuous metal skin. You can think of it almost like a balloon, but it's made of steel, three millimetres thick. Now, that would be a perfect shield to keep all the RFI inside the building, except for this little problem, you've got to get a few things through it. You've got to get people in. You've got to get air in. You've got to get electricity in and you've got to get all the signals from the telescopes in. So for example, if you open a door, the RFI the, the, can leak out. So we have uh, an airlock style door, basically. So there's two doors, you only ever open one at a time. 
So we keep all the noise inside the building. And that's also, of course, why the building is so boring to look at, because we can't have windows and stuff. The, the, the poor architect, when he became engaged with designing this, was so excited, he thought, oh, I can build an iconic fascinating building out in the, in, in the red outback with the telescopes and it'll be really exciting architecturally and as we laid out the requirements and more and more well, no windows, no, no, can't have them uh, he just got more and more depressed, it was no longer going to be the iconic <laughs> facility, it was just a really boring building <laughs> so, so this is one of these RFI doors so we'll go through this skin into a little RFI lock and then through the other door Sorry. And this sound, which is almighty in person, is the sound of a supercomputer. So what's happened with radio astronomy recently is that the things that we used to think of as cutting edge and that were the expensive, difficult parts, the antennas that you're seeing here, they're not. They're, they're straightforward, the engineering matters, but the really cutting edge part these days is all in the signal processing. It's all in the computing system. So just as an example, only a tiny percentage of the budget for this telescope has gone into the telescopes. Most of the budget goes into the phased array feeds, these very exciting radio cameras we've developed, and then into the huge supercomputing back end, which is largely a custom system that CSIRO has had to build itself. Just how much data is flowing between these things and that building over there? So that's one of the absolutely unique things about this. So we've got a, nearly 100 terabits of data a second. That's one of those meaningless numbers. What does that mean? That is about the same as the entire internet bandwidth around the world and around the mid June 2015. That's when the worldwide internet went through that 100 terabit per second barrier. So think of all your worst movies, everything that's flowing through the internet every second, the equivalent to that, but in better taste, is going into that building every second. And despite the fact that this data that's flowing in and out of that building, it's truly phenomenal, it's almost invisible when you're on site. And it's hard not to just stare at the antenna, the dishes that stand scattered across the open landscape. So that one is about... That should be antenna 36, that particular one you're seeing there, and that's three kilometres north of the core here. So ASCAP runs out to uh, only about six kilometres, um, and that will allow us to see things as small as about 10 arc seconds on the sky. So 10 arc seconds is about um, one 360th of a degree. So it's, it's, it's not as high resolution as, as some optical telescopes, but it's pretty good. And particularly given we're going to be able to map the entire sky at that resolution with great sensitivity, what we'll know in five or ten years from this telescope is, is well, we don't know. It's, that's the exciting part for us. It's wow. a lot of fun. In its own really bizarre way, it's a lot of fun. So, um, and it, and you're here for the long game, of course, because you know we spent. Well, I've spent nearly ten years working on it. Others have been, you know, well before me, in fact, with thinking about it. And the really top science will be coming out once those surveys are taken, and that's five years away, maybe even ten. And it, but in some ways, I mean, time isn't irrelevant. But you know, a year in human time is sort of irrelevant in astronomical yeah. time, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 minuscule, you know, and at a personal level. I'm just so excited that this year, 2017 now, we've started the early science. Right through the year, we're going to be increasing the capability. And, you know, 2018, we're going to be moving into full operations. 2019, we'll be adding more software capability. So it's a, it's a very long, progressive tale to get these facilities up and running. It's very exciting. The thing is, look where we're doing it. One of the fantastic aspects of this site, the fact that it's so old and it's, it's so interesting in terms of Australia's outback history, we're in a, in a funny area called the Yilgaon Basin. Behind us over here we have Mount Naria on the neighbouring station and the rocks there are some of the oldest ever discovered on the surface of the Earth. They're around 3.4 billion years old. So the Earth is only around 4.7 billion years old. And then just north of here in the World Ranges, we have rocks that are over 4 billion years old. So this area of, of the world, in fact, is some of the oldest rocks ever discovered. And you, you really get a sense of that, I think, when you're in the landscape out here. Well, I'm not sure about anybody else, but I'm, I'm quite excited and proud that 
you know, we've got the leading scientific organisation in the world, CSIRO, on, it, on our country. So um, I don't think I'm against or most Aboriginal people are not against the building anything out on country. We just, we just want you to respect respect us, respect our land, um, 40 odd thousand years old, we've been here. Um, yeah, we're not, we're not against anything being built out here, just have respect for our sites and our land. I was told by an elder, um, Geoffrey Mungu, that um, out on that site out there, um, we actually had a Yamaji god, and, and his name was Bijul, and I asked him where he was from, and he goes out there where the antennas are. And I thought, wow, well, how, how cool is that? He stopped there looking down at us, I don't know. <laughs> how good is that? I was, I was a bit excited, it wasn't about anybody else. <laughs> a Wadjuri guide, and a group of antenna looking at the dawn of the universe. This is the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder sitting on Wadjuri country, the Murchison in Western Australia. This set of antenna is the precursor that proves and tests some of the technology that will be going into the Square Kilometre Array, the really big one that will spread between South Africa and Australia, and it'll be at the same site in WA. The Pathfinder project and site is run by the Australian Telescope National Facility, which is a part of the CSIRO. And I'm part of the ABC. This is Off Track. I'm Ann Jones. And remember to meet me here at the same time next time, because that's when I'll take you somewhere else. Bealy, Yalabidi, Marlu, um, Willara, Bundara. Um, I feel very proud. You know, we, um, uh, we have survived, and you know, we we move with the times as well. So. You know, I'd be proud that I, I actually have a, I come from this country, still speak, well, I'm not a full speaker of the language, but I'm still learning, so, and that connects me to country and, and identifies who I am. Bealy, Yalabidi, Marlu, Willara, Bundara.